And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. And uh, i got to warn you, this is, this is one of the most difficult passages of Scripture that I've ever, ever encountered as far as working my way through it and, and um, trying to come to a good understanding of it. And I, I've spent as much time in the office as I can this week working on this and, and uh, even time at home. And I mean, it's just been a bear. And so, um, not that there's a problem with the text. There's a problem, I guess there's a problem with me, right? And just trying to get my mind wrapped around it. And so pray for me, all right, as we, as we look into this. But I believe, I believe God has got something good for us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did enter into the seventh day, or did, did rest in the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would, not, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. I don't know if anybody has ever heard this name before, Gary Kildall. Anybody ever heard the name Gary Kildall before? You just heard it. Right? You're lying to me. No. Gary Kildall wrote the first operating system for personal computers. And, and he named it CPM, and he did this in 1973. And in 1980, IBM approached Mr. Kindall, uh, or Kildall about developing the operation system for their IBM PCs. But Gary Kildall snubbed these IBM officials on the day that they were supposed to meet. And he went flying in his new airplane instead. And when they came calling, he was gone. And so IBM turned to somebody else. They reached out instead to Bill Gates. You've probably heard of him. And he developed the operating system called MS-DOS. And today, Bill Gates is worth $98 billion. Gary Kildall would have to live the rest of his life haunted by four ghastly words. What might have been, right? How would you like to live your whole life knowing that you had missed out on such a momentous opportunity? That'd be, that'd be just as bad as missing the opportunity itself is the guilt over it, right? You, you would, would you be haunted by the image of what might have been? Now I want you to listen to this. God offers you an opportunity that is far more valuable than $98 billion. It's priceless. What is that opportunity? God offers you the opportunity of rest. Now, Brent, don't get any ideas. Not now, okay? <laughs> but God offers you the opportunity of rest. And it's a rest that money cannot buy. God promises you rest if you will just receive it. Look in our text again with me at verse 9. The Bible says, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Do you see that? God has promised us a rest, and that promise remains. It remains open to you and to me today. It is the remaining promise of rest. God commands us to receive that promise of rest. In, in verse 11, 
here's the command. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. God tells us we must labor. We must do our diligence to claim his promise of rest and to enter into it. Now, how do we do that? How do we, how do we enter into God's promise, claim God's promise of rest? Verse 3 tells us that. In verse 3 it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. You see that? To claim God's promise of rest, we have to believe. It's faith. Belief claims that promise of rest. Have you claimed God's promise of rest for your life? If you have, how do you know? Well, belief in God's rest must produce evidence evidence of its presence. If it's there, it will be obvious. What evidence does this belief produce in your life and in my life? And that's the question that's addressed in this text. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, the, the book of Hebrews, and this, this part of it especially, the book of Hebrews was written to Jews in the first century who had, they believed in Jesus, but, but this Hebrew Christian assembly, even though they believed in Jesus, they were not at rest. That's why when you read through this passage of Scripture, you're going to see several times the word rest. And you're going to see several times the, the author of Hebrews saying, enter in, now you need to get to this place of rest. He's really hammering that thought home because the Hebrew Christian believers of that first century congregation, they were not at rest. They were not at rest because of persecution pressures from the outside and they were being persecuted um, for leaving their past life in Judaism they were excluded from their society from their families they were tempted then to go back into Judaism they were not at rest because of temptation it would be so life would seem so much better so much easier if they would go back they wouldn't have to deal with all the strife that was going on in their life if they would just go back to the old life. And then this assembly was not at rest because there were, in fact, unbelievers in their ranks. Those who, they were attracted to the gospel. They were especially attracted to the benefits of the gospel. Maybe they were even considering Christ, but they had never yet placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, called on these early Jewish believers to claim God's promise and to enter into his rest. And this morning our text here, God's word calls on us to do the same, to enter God's rest by faith. Belief is the door to God's promised rest. And if you have by faith claimed that rest, then that belief in your life will produce three evidences because this is, after all, a Baptist sermon. There will be three evidences what are they? What are the three evidences of this belief in our life? The first evidence is an understanding of the promise of rest. When we believe God's promise of rest, we enter into that rest through the belief. That belief produces, first of all, this evidence, understanding the promise of rest. What is God's promise rest? We can't believe in what we do not know or understand, right? Belief produces an understanding of what that rest is. So let's look at the text here. Let's look at what the Bible says when it speaks of this rest. It gives us two biblical pictures and then one principle from those two uh, pictures comes into focus. The two biblical pictures of God's rest in this text the first one is God's Sabbath rest. God's Sabbath rest. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. And look at this. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day and on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now when we... When we make a reference to the Old Testament, we usually give chapter and verse, right? We would say Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2. That's what is being referenced here. But uh, for, for uh, 
Hebrew believers of the first century, they, they didn't have chapter and verse division. So you just say, well, back in the Old Testament, this is what they said. And, and, uh, and they would have understood what he was talking about. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, that's what's being re referenced here. God, in six days, created the world. And on the seventh day, he rested. God's Sabbath rest illustrates two important facts about the promise of rest to us. And the one fact is that our rest has a definite basis. It is based upon God's finished work. Rest means to cease from one form of activity in order to give yourself wholly to a new enterprise. And so if we, if we understand how God created in six days the universe and the world and everything in it, and then on the seventh day he rested. Why? Not because he was tired, but because he was done. Right? And so the Sabbath rest is based on God's finished works. Look at verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has, also has ceased from his own works. Why? As God did from his. God, God's Sabbath rest is based on his finished work. And God ceased creating. And, and, um, and it says here in verse 3, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, our rest has a definite basis. It is finished, the finished work of God. That's the first fact that this picture of Sabbath rest, rest teaches us about our rest. The second fact is this, our rest has infinite value. This infinite value. When God finished his creation, right, now think about who God is and what he can do. God had just created everything that we see and everything we don't see. I mean, he created it all. What's the first thing he does? Takes a Sabbath day. Takes a rest. And he doesn't need to. God's not tired. He's not worn out. This was not hard for him. He just spoke it into existence, right? But he does that. Why? Because he is placing a value on it. God devoted one-seventh of his creation week to, to rest. And that fact demonstrates how valuable it is. Every believer has a guaranteed future rest in heaven. And that's because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross when he paid and died and paid for our sins. John chapter 19 verse 30 records what Jesus said on the cross. Jesus said, it is finished right before he bowed his head and breathed his last. The wages of sin is death. And so Jesus paid that penalty in his death when he died. And that penalty, our penalty for our sins, was paid in full. That means I don't have to meet Jesus halfway to heaven. I don't have to climb a certain way. No, he reached all the way down for me, paying all of my debts on the cross. That's why the Bible says that in Jesus we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins through his blood in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. That forgiveness in our future rest in heaven is based on that one finished work when Jesus on the cross yelled out, it is finished. Redemption's work had been done. Now our future rest is based on that finished work. Our present rest is also based on the finished work of Christ. In verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter rest. I want you to notice the tense of that, of that entering, right? It's present tense. In other words, it's not talking about going into heaven right now. When you got saved, when you trusted Christ, did, did your life immediately become heaven? No. When God saves us, we don't just immediately transport into heaven. No, we still got a ways to live by His grace. And so entering into rest is expressed here in the present tense. Our rest is not only uh, someday down the road when, when the Lord comes back or if we uh, pass away and enter into heaven... Uh, that's a promise that we can take great comfort in, but there is a rest that is a present possession for us to have now. And it is also based on the finished work of Christ because without our sins being taken away, we have no peace with God. 
and no rest. There is a, a, a first picture of our rest. That is God's Sabbath rest. And it, it says to us that, that our, our rest has a real basis. God's finished work. There's a second picture of our rest in this text, and it is Israel's rest in Canaan. Israel's Canaan rest. In verse 3, it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as, have I, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter in my rest. And in this place again, verse 5, And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as, he, as it is said, Today, if you will hear, your, hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, and Jesus is the Greek word for Joshua, all right? So it's talking about Joshua in the book of Joshua. For if Jesus or if Joshua had given them rest, he's talking about when Joshua led Israel into Canaan land. If Joshua had given them rest, then would he not have afterwards spoken of another day? All right. Our text here quotes the 95th Psalm, which we read a couple weeks ago. Psalm 95 verse 11 says, Unto whom I swear in my wrath, that they shall not enter into my rest. In verse 7 of Psalm, uh, or verse 7 of our text quotes Psalm 95 and verse 7 and 8. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. To what do these texts refer? Well, they describe a day in Israel's history when they were encamped in Kadesh Barnea on the edge of the wilderness and they refused to enter into the promised land. God delivered Israel out of Egypt by mighty acts and miracles. Not long after that, the nation came to the edge of the promised land in Kadesh Barnea, and they sent out 12 spies to the land. Ten spies came back after 40 days and said they would be unable to conquer Canaan because the cities were too fortified. And in Numbers chapter 13, they went through this. The walls are too high. The people of the land were giants. They were too big and strong. They were going to have to do battle in the promised land with the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the giants, the children of Anak. Two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, Yeah, these, this, this enemy is strong and their, their walls are impressive, but God is bigger. God can do it. Israel believed the ten spies and they refused to enter Canaan. In Numbers chapter 14 tells us what happened next in verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. And what did God say to this? Well, he swore that they would never enter his rest in Canaan. In verse 22 of Numbers chapter 14 says, Because, this is God speaking to them, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did, did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and, I, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And so Israel would be forced to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. What kind of rest then what kind of rest is pictured in Canaan? Remember, rest means to cease from one form of activity and give yourself wholly over to another enterprise. What kind of rest do you see pictured in Canaan? Sometimes some of the old hymns picture Canaan as heaven and the Jordan River as death and you cross over the Jordan River into Canaan and that's heaven. But I, I want to want you to think about this. When I go to heaven, I don't want to have to fight a whole lot of battles. I don't want seven mighty warring nations waiting for me on heaven's shore. Do you? I don't believe Canaan is a picture of heaven. 
<clears throat> in order to enter the rest of the promised land of Canaan, Israel would have to cease from their former activity of camping in the wilderness and they would have to invade Canaan, crossing over the Jordan, doing battle. It was grisly business. In order to enter into that rest, they would have to obey God, fighting, striving. So obedience, disobedience to God, could only flow out of one thing, and that is faith in God. That's why they didn't obey. Because they didn't believe. So when they, when they would defeat the enemy, they, they would find rest, finally, in the land of Canaan. And so we have these two biblical pictures. One is God's Sabbath rest. It demonstrates that our rest is based upon God's finished work. And then we have Israel's Canaan rest that demonstrates that our present rest is realized when we trust the Lord for victory in His battle. See, God delivered Israel out of Egypt. That's a picture of salvation. He brought them to Canaan. They didn't need to be saved again. And he didn't let them go back to Egypt. But they wandered in the wilderness. And so Israel's Canaan rest demonstrates that our present rest is realized as we trust the Lord for victory in his battles. And so those are the two pictures. Let me give you the one principle that, that gives us the meaning of rest is this. Rest is a state of God's blessed peace that we enter by faith. Rest is is a state of God's blessing and peace as we enter it by faith. This is the understanding that faith produces in us. We understand that rest is a state of peace that we enter by faith given to us based on the finished work of Christ. There is an eternal rest yet future that will enter into in heaven, but there is a present rest of peace for us to enter into today. In God's rest, we cease our wandering and experience His peace, His victory, His blessing in this Christian life. Let me tell you what rest is not before we elaborate on what it is. Rest is not a change in your circumstances. Most people have diff difficult circumstances in their lives because we live in a fallen world, right? Right? And, and, and it makes things difficult and, and we're tempted to believe that if we could only solve that one circumstance or those two circumstances, if we can get that resolved, those circumstances changed, then we'll have peace, then we'll have rest, then we'll enjoy life. It could be a financial or a physical or an emotional need and, 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 and so we're tempted to seek only the solution that will meet that felt need. But if you do that, what are you going to do? You're going to make an idol. You're going to make a golden calf out of that thing that's meeting your need in the moment. Money, job, career, physical wellness, a feeling, a personal goal, anything that you've had this need and maybe God supplies it. You've, the, the need is fulfilled. But then if you just... If you just focus on the gift to the exclusion of the giver, then you're an idolater. And so um, the problem is that when the circumstances we focused on, when that circumstance finally changes, it's kind of like I have this problem if I drink too much coffee in the evening and I'm laying in bed and I'm staring into the darkness. My wife is asleep because she can do that. And uh, I'm... I'm staring into the darkness, I'm tired, but I'm, I can't sleep, and something itches, always. So I scratch that itch, you know. And as soon as I'm done scratching that itch, shoulder itches, that's done. Oh, knee, all right. And I'm going head and shoulders, knees and toes, you know, especially in the wintertime when it's dry. And that's the same problem. I think it's, it's going to be all over and I'm going to rest as soon as I scratch that itch. And then another one. It probably itched somewhere else too, and I didn't notice it until I scratched the first one, right? You know what? It's the same thing when we believe we'll find rest in solving a circumstance. Oh, I just got to, if, if I can get that one thing, then I will have rest. 
Well, guess what? As soon as you get that one thing, something else is going to itch. You're going to want the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And what that is, is just one giant chasing of the wind. Until you're dead. Rest is not a change of circumstance. Rest is not a denial of reality either. You can't just go along and say, ah, it's all good. My life's falling apart, but everything's good. That's not rest either. That's just insanity. Rest is a state of blessed peace that we experience as we trust Christ and his finished work of, for victory. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7 was written by the Apostle Paul in prison. He said, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Five years in the clink and he's still writing that stuff. John 16, 33, Jesus told his disciples, by the way, in a few hours he'd be arrested and crucified and they would be running for their lives. But he says to this, and I hope they kept it in mind, I think they did since they wrote this down. Um, Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We read earlier where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, and for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Because God's rest is a blessed state and not a circumstance, or not a change in circumstances, because of that, nobody and nothing can take it from you. You understand that? That's what's so good about it. We, have, we, we enter into God's rest, God's promised rest by belief, by faith in Christ. Have you entered into his rest this way? I'm not talking about heaven. All right. Uh, if I was asking about heaven, I wouldn't be asking, have you entered yet? All right. But belief gives us three evidences in our life of that belief. The first evidence is an understanding of that rest. I think most Christians who place their faith in Christ understand that we should be at rest. Where there should be a peace that passes all understanding. So the first evidence is a evidence of rest. What is the second evidence that this belief manifests in our life? The second evidence is this. Obedience to the God of rest. Obedience to the one who promised rest. If you truly believe the Lord's promise, you're going to act on that belief. Faith without works is dead. Obedience, as we used to sing in Awana when I was a kid, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe, right? We even spelled it. Here it says in our text, verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into that rest. Belief is expressed in obedience. Unbelief is expressed in disobedience. Here in verse 11, it says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. This verse holds two contrasting uh, ideas in balance. The one, idea is, the one idea is unbelief. What's on the other side of that balance? Is it belief? Faith? No, it's labor. Labor. It says, Let us labor. And let us labor here means let us give diligence. It means to be hasty, to do it now, to exert ourselves in, in effort. Now what is this saying? It's not saying that we have to earn our way to heaven through good works. That's not what it's saying. What does it mean then? Or our text is telling us that if we really trust God's promise of rest, we will obey Him. And we will we'll be willing to fight the battles that He directs us to fight whether against the world, the flesh, or the devil. And we'll be will, willing to win the victories that he empowers us to win and enter into his rest. Belief produces action, produces obedience. Last week, many of you demonstrated your belief in your boss. You believed that if you would go to work on time, clock in, do your work, come home you believe that he would pay you right how do I know that you believed in your boss 
because you went to work. If you didn't believe that, would you go? Some, do any of you enjoy your job that much? Maybe? I don't know. Well, belief in God's ability to give you rest produces action in the same way. It produces obedience. Um, you know, whole religious denominations right now are arguing over, arguing with each other over uh, whether or not they should uh, ordain homosexual priests and clergy and all that stuff. Why? Why are they arguing over that? That's because they do not believe what God says about sexuality. And because of that, they have no rest and no peace. Their entire religion is chasing the wind, trying to scratch the itch of what they feel is a need. That is not so with us. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Do you believe him on that account? You could ask a couple of questions. Have, how have you denied yourself for Christ lately? What, is it to, what does it mean to deny yourself? Well, that means to tell yourself no. Say no to something that you want that Christ forbids. Or Christ says not now. Or Christ says no to. Do you believe that saying no to your most desired sin will bring you peace and rest? Not in the moment of temptation sometimes, right? Um, have you taken up the cross of Christ? Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Uh, that means to die to self in order that you might live for Christ. Is your life just a series of decisions made with one goal in mind, and that is to satisfy a present need or a felt need? Or do you agree with 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of of God you say well I just can't do that good that's step one is to admit that you have a problem step two is to understand that none of us can do that and that we must avail ourselves to the to the grace of God in verse 16 here in our text let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain, obtain mercy. And look at this, I love this. And find grace to what? To help when? In time of need. You know, when we're being tempted like these, these early Hebrew Christians were being tempted. They had, they had a need. And that need was to stay faithful to the Lord. That was their greatest need. And he says, come boldly in Christ. You have a high priest and you have all the help available to you we enter God's promised rest by faith by belief and that belief gives us these evidences one understanding of rest two obedience the second the second evidence obedience to the rest to the God of rest let's look at the third one the third evidence of this obedience of this uh, belief is fear fear for those who are missing the promise of rest Fear for those who don't have it. Our text commands us to enter his rest. And we ought to obey that command. Our text also, though, commands us to fear. The Bible many times tells us not to be afraid of certain things. But here it commands us to fear. And when we believe God's promise of rest, we fear for those who might be missing out on it. Look at verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, he says, let us therefore fear. Us refers to those who are in the rest. The, the writer of Hebrews is in this rest. He can speak in the first person here. And he's speaking in the first person plural. So there were people in this church who were in, entered into that rest. But then he says, lest any of you should seem to come short. Who's us and who's you? Well, us is those in the rest. Any of you in this text, he says you, he refers to those who want to enter, but fail to enter into that rest. This letter written to 
Of course, we've identified the audience, these early Hebrew Christians, and there were those among them that might fall short of God's rest. What does that mean to fear for them? Well, two groups of people could fall short of that rest. One, there were Jewish people among them uh, in that congregation attracted to the gospel message. They thought, yeah, there's something real there, but they had never been saved. They never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so they had no chance at ever entering into God's rest in this life or in the next life. And spend their life, their eternal life, in torment. If they went back to Judaism now, they would lose everything. There was also Jewish believers there who were... They were saved. You know, they, 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 they were secure forever in Christ. But the pressure to return to Judaism was huge. They were about to cave to that pressure. If you read through the book of Hebrews, you'll see all over the place commands. Let us hold fast to our profession, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. In verse 14 of, our, of chapter 3, if we hold fast to the beginning of our conf uh, confidence, steadfast to the end. Then it goes over and over and over again of, of hanging on to our profession of faith. Why would, why would the writer of Hebrews make such passionate uh, pleas to people who are saved? Could they lose their salvation? Well, no. But there was a problem here. Persecution of rejection enticed them to go back. The comfort of being accepted enticed them to go back. But what would happen to them if they did? They wouldn't lose their salvation, but they would lose the present rest in this Christian life. And in going back to Judaism, they would be separated from the church, separated from God's people, and separated from where God was doing His work. And their lives then would be would resemble the lives of the Israelites who wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, barren and unfruitful and suffering and wandering and pointless until their carcass fell in that wilderness. Oh, they'd go to heaven. But who would want to live that life first? The writer of Hebrews says, we ought to fear that. It's something worthy of our fear. So many Christians today have no rest, no peace. I like this quote from John Phillips. He says, Many believers have the idea that failure to enter into all that God has for them in Christ is regrettable but not serious. They have no idea what they're missing out on. He also says, John Phillips, it is a serious thing not to go on in the Christian life and that is the chief burden of this whole epistle. Look with me at chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, look at this, let us go on to perfection. You know what he's saying? He said, stop... Stop being tempted to go back. You guys have been, you're supposed to be growing in your faith. You're supposed to be moving towards Christ's likeness. And all you are are babes in Christ. I can only feed you with milk, he says in chapter 5, and not strong meat. Let's move on, he's saying, basically, almost in a frustrated voice. So many Christians today are wandering in the wilderness. No rest. They refuse to believe the Lord's command to enter his rest. And that refusal is expressed in their constant disobedience. Sadly, they seek rest and peace in every other place except for faith in God and faith in Christ. And they never find it. If we truly believe God's promise of rest, all oh, will fear missing it. And we'll fear for those Others who are missing, those who are not saved that we know, will fear enough to tell them the gospel of Christ. Today, Gary Kildall is not worth $98 billion. What a missed opportunity. 
Today, we have a greater opportunity than that. God's rest. $98 billion doesn't scratch the surface of that value. We enter it by faith. Belief expressed by obedience. Let's stand together.